Hello, everyone. Thank you, Veronica. Okay, so uh, we'll have uh, three or four interesting presentations, so I hope you will enjoy all of them. But uh, the question for the first one is, uh, what's the best way product teams can deliver the best products to the customers? I always uh, was a fan of design thinking, and uh, I always thought that we stepped off on the right foot uh, with product management at Candica Content. Because instead of focusing on solution, we thought about jobs to be done, we're focused on the problems, and uh, we pretty regularly done the research. It's funny because sometimes even stakeholders when were unhappy because of us doing too much research, and we regularly test uh, our concepts uh, for usability and viability. But even uh, when we are doing this customer-focused product discovery, things were good for a product manager's perspective and from the product team's happiness, etc. cetera. Uh, pressure was from both sides. From the team side, uh, it was very difficult to engage the teams and to see involvement in uh, an interest in what is going to be actual impact on the customer. And inside the team, everything, every smallest decision and a question about the problem and the solution was on the shoulders of the product manager. Then from the stakeholders point of view, uh, there wasn't evidently enough trust for the stakeholders not to intervene in what's going to be delivered and what's not. Also, our roadmap contained a lot of important things that we always felt a constant pressure to focus on the next big thing on the pipeline. So these are pretty serious things to solve. And luckily, this was like uh, two years ago before we started changing the way we work with the teams and with the stakeholders. A funny thing is that I stumbled upon these uh, social media posts uh, from Teresa Torres. And funny thing about that is that back then, I genuinely thought that uh, everything would be better and it would solve all, all, all the problems if uh, the product project management responsibilities were handed over on someone, onto someone else, for example, the team or a project manager. But uh, I couldn't have been more wrong because as it turned out, it was just a symptom of a deeper issue of how we do the product discovery. So during this session, I wanted to share with you uh, the steps that we took perhaps to inspire also other product teams. My name is Thomas Ruby. I work as a product manager at Candica Content and I really like to have a chat with you about uh, product discovery or your issues with product management or experience at your company. So please uh, connect on the socials and reach out sometimes. So product discovery. Discovery in general is a very generic word. So it helps to frame the concept somehow. Well, in software development, there is always a risk that your ideas are biased and that you don't actually deliver uh, the actual value to the customer and you are not able to collect it and therefore waste the efforts. And product discovery from the product management point of view is aiming at uh, re reducing this risk by focusing more on the problem and less on the solution. So two years back, uh, the process uh, we called product discovery was uh, a series of the following steps. First, the product manager aligned on the desired outcome and things that we needed to solve with other product managers and with the stakeholders. Then primarily the product manager, but sometimes with the help of a designer, they research the topic, everything uh, that we needed to know in order to move on to the definition phase where typically the product manager defined a good mental model how to divide different jobs to be done inside a problem space and uh, picked priorities and a set of important jobs to be done to be solved. Then typically a PM with uh, uh, the designer uh, ideated a solution and uh, tested it uh, for its usability. Uh, and this ended the discovery phase. The output was kind of like the MVP that we then communicated to the rest of the company and also to the customers. And then the delivery was more agile, right? We were chopping up uh, uh, to multiple releases. After each one, we um, revisited the scope, uh, re changed the priorities. And typically at the end of this, uh, we ended up with something different that was originally planned or the delivery prolonged by uh, a few weeks or months. And this was undermining the relationship of stakeholders and the teams and their trust. And that was mostly because we were continuing to do two main mistakes. 
uh, first that we align on the output and then because we did uh, uh, only linear and not continuous discovery. So uh, the outputs, the MVP that will be defined, it was not solution focused. It was still jobs to be done, but very specific activity jobs to be done that were in the scope. And uh, since the things rapidly changed throughout the uh, delivery process, it uh, stopped making sense to align on this. So instead of, for example, aligning on things like, or goals like uh, we wanted our users to be able to group content into semantic structures or groups or folders, uh, we needed to come up with uh, why we are actually doing this, what we are trying to achieve, if we were successful, what would life look like, uh, how we want to transform the customer's behavior. So instead of saying that, we would align with others on that we want multi-team companies to perform their content production or content operations in the same place. And then the organizational aspect is just a core part of that. So the, the aligning on the outcomes helped uh, re giving a blur to the scope a bit, uh, but still uh, other departments or stakeholders might uh, uh, evaluate or see different criteria for meeting that outcome. And basically, you know the concepts of OKRs probably, we started adopting them and removed uh, the focus on the scope completely. So this was the first important step. Then uh, there is the time aspect for us, which is pretty critical because most of the features that we do and most of the customers that we work with are large enterprises. And it's so difficult for them to adopt new features and change how they do things because uh, first, it uh, typically requires implementation or changing the process. It's expensive and they have other priorities. So after we release something, we typically have a feedback lag of several weeks or months until we have actionable feedback. So uh, that led us to make two more changes. First, adopting more experimental approach and then changing how we align with the customers and the rest of the company through our roadmap. So what I mean by the experimental mindset is that uh, instead of focusing on uh, the single discovery and trying to solve uh, the outcome or meet the outcome in a single cycle, uh, we embrace the idea that we weren't able to do that and there is the feedback lag, feedback lag and instead of that uh, uh, we chopped or we perceived what we are trying to deliver more as market experiments. The main goal of the market experiments is for us to test and be able to aim better, not to ship, in, especially in the in the first phases. So instead of thinking in MVPs, what we actually did was first deliver something that's uh, testable, uh, but it couldn't be called viable. Uh, typically, what we are doing is we are releasing early accesses or closed betas just for us to learn. Then in the initial phases, then we redo most of the phases of the discovery. And typically we either pivot or build, build on top of the solution. And in two or more iterations, hopefully we are able to meet the objective or perhaps uh, abandon an objective completely. So uh, typically a team is working on two objectives at the same time, one stale and one active, right? Um, yeah, so adopting this experimental mindset uh, was uh, a necessary step, but it was also necessary to communicate it better uh, to the outside world. So the time aspect on the roadmap actually uh, blocked us and actually a lot of customers and commercial department members were counting on the many important features that were there to uh, be delivered in that time frame. And we were just unable uh, because of limited resources to focus on so many topics at the same time. So we had limited resources and we needed to communicate the fact that we are only able to focus on a few outcomes at the same time through a different type of roadmap. So in the theme-based roadmap, it helped us communicate exactly the same thing. Uh, you could imagine it as having three main horizons uh, with different types of confidence. The uh, next horizon is something that most probably we are going to be focusing on, but again, uh, some important priorities might crop up. The later horizon is something that uh, it's purely for information of what might be the important topics a year from now, but uh, they are very likely to change. And we also have the evaluating topics that we don't consider um, 
core parts of uh, our products yet and are waiting for the act for the feedback to come up and then the topic is going to appear in the now or the next phases of course everything that we put on the roadmap we try to do it outcome oriented and uh, not solution or scope oriented yeah so these three things are uh, aligning on the outcome instead of output then doing a continuous experimental approach discovery and communicating it clearly to all of uh, our customers and the departments was an important step for the stakeholders to trust us that we do the product the best way. So what about the teams now? What is actually a developer's job, right? Should they code or what, what, what is their job? So that's a great question because as you might have seen that the previous discovery process was heavily PM led. Uh, most of the things were decided by the PM and actually that caused that every single question about the solution or a problem needed to be answered by the product manager. And don't get me wrong, but uh, I think that product managers sometimes cause this issue because they think that it's their job uh, to decide and only communicate what's important to the teams, either developers or designers, not to overwhelm them with unnecessary details. And uh, it couldn't be further from the truth because uh, the teams only having bits and pieces of information and not the full context is the actual problem why they can't take ownership and accountability over the solution. So the ideal state we wanted to achieve is that uh, the product manager is responsible for first choosing the right outcome and then help the team navigate the problem space, give them the necessary context. Whereas the team's uh, role, we want it to be uh, the accountability on that the solution is meeting the outcome and that we will build effective solutions. So how do we? How did we do that? Well, we started from the end of the pro discovery process and went backwards and tried to involve uh, the devs and the designers and made them uh, a core part of the discovery process. So the first most natural part for the teams is the delivery. And uh, well, developers, hate extra work right and the okrs were very often perceived as such uh and the the important mistake that we were making is that uh, the product manager came up with the key results and they imposed uh, that on the team so instead of that we needed to be having the discussions and having the teams uh, coming up with uh, uh, the key results themselves and typically what we do in this experimental approach is that in the early phases, we are focusing more on the qualitative insights, for example, uh, in-depth case studies or one or two first adopters. Then uh, in later phases of the discovery, in the later, later cycles of the discovery, we switch to more quantitative metrics like uh, conversion funnels or adoption funnels. And in the initial phases, we are focusing more on the leading metrics, which means that they don't give us uh, exact confidence that uh, people adopted the feature or were successful in their task, but it's the first steps that indicate that they might do that in the future. Whereas in the later phases, we put key results that are more uh, assuring and more stable and that actually represent meeting the actual goal. Uh, an important shift in this was uh, that the actual team was actually reporting the uh, what we learned and the progress in the key results to the stakeholders. This kicked off an interesting dynamic within the teams because we uh, funded or started meeting regularly every two weeks on meetings uh, that we call TNOKRs when things that typically only a product manager did, for example, uh, getting information from customer success about uh, uh, customer's adoption of that feature or from sales or basically communicating uh, uh, the progress of the adoption. And uh, that was something that uh, we started assigning to the team's backlog and we discussed uh, together. So this in increased the involvement and accountability on the of the effectiveness of the solution a lot and what we are trying to experiment uh, now and uh, we can share them the results in the future is that we would like to uh, invite also other departments to work in this phase uh, because why not for example revenue operations and the marketing uh, can't join us in these discussions and be aligned on what we are trying to achieve and also chime in with their initiatives, for example, helping promote the feature better, etc. So 
Before that, it's important to build the team's accountability of the solution itself. Then you can build on the accountability of the effectiveness of the solution. And the mistake that we were making is that uh, the ideation phase was mostly done by the PM and the UX designer, sometimes with a, a dev representative. Um, however, it's a very good idea to uh, invite everyone in a design studio to start building uh, and them investing their effort into the solution. Uh, a risk or a pitfall of a good, good design studio is always the framing. You don't want it to be too broad because you get lost and ineffective. You don't want it to be too solution focused because you lose the creativity aspect. A good framework for this for the teams is uh, the how might we questions that you might Google later. And uh, then the important part when you actually come up with the solutions and then prioritize uh, not to prioritize the product manager instead of the themes. Uh, what you should be doing is to provide the necessary context and background for teams to be able to uh, prioritize by themselves. And then a few frameworks for prioritization. If you have competing ideas, a good ways or frameworks to uh, compare is impact mapping or opportunity solution trees. And if you have a single idea, which can be then still narrowed down, a good framework is user story mapping for that. Um, so that's the solution and how we can make the team actually a solution owner. So how about uh, uh, the phase before that? Uh, that's actually the main domain of the product manager. They are the problem owner. And what we do, we create in this phase documents that we call problem definitions, which are really comprehensive uh, guides or maps of the problem, problem landscape. They typically include from the high level things uh, like um, a business outcome, actually why we are doing this instead of other things, why now, why not later, then things about the problem, which are the personas involved, what are the jobs to be done involved. And actually in complex problem spaces, the product manager is responsible for coming up with a good mental model, how to divide the problem space to more digestible chunks and how to navigate that. But also things like adjacent concepts. For example, right now we are um, trying to achieve an objective that all types of content can can be approved uh, within Kentico. And this, and we are, but we also have a concept of tasks, for example. So uh, how does this concept compete? Should we revisit one? Should we merge them, etc. So this complexity and the systemic impact should be inside a problem definition too but also the long-term vision so that we can deliver value that we can then build on top of and compound in the future. Uh, and also naturally the competition, but not in a descriptive way, but instead uh, a good and bad examples of how uh, competitors are trying to reach the outcome uh, with the customers. So again, the same thing as in the ideation phase, it's a good idea to involve designers and developers in this phase too. For example, we were very successful with developers doing the competition analysis or designers doing that because they start to absorb and build a picture. And when we are uh, talking about the absorption, uh, it's very important. This phase typically happens, the definition phase, when team is delivering the previous objective or is uh, one cycle behind. But it's very important that the whole team finds enough time to absorb and to discuss the problem space so that they can then proceed and make the ideation effective. The mistake that I was uh, doing it was uh, being too passive in the discussions, just asking whether every, everything is clear, everyone that nods their heads was wrong. And I now tend to be more interactive, trying to ask uh, uh, the developers, the designers to repeat what issues they are seeing and how they see the problem space and um, try to be more interactive this way. So if we then move even one step uh, closer or back in time, there the exploration phase. The mistake that I was making here was involving the designer too late in the process. Typically, I prepared the uh, um, research design and then together with the designer, we did the sessions. Then mostly I analyzed the results sometimes with the designer. But right now, uh, the best thing I could change uh, and do differently was to uh, involve the designer from the day one when I know what the objective is going to be and do the problem of uh, the research design and the execution analysis together. 
And uh, a tip, uh, since you are doing this phase uh, before or when the, uh, the previous experiment is being delivered, book at least four weeks to do because it's impossible and then you will get into a lag. And uh, another thing is how to involve the deaf devs in this process and we don't invite developers anymore at least in my teams uh on the research calls it's a different story when we are talking about testings uh, like usability or concept testings before because they are swift but the research calls are pretty long and instead what uh, we found more effective is uh, we booked 15 or 20 minutes for example, after daily stand-up for bite-sized empathy sessions, where like for seven minutes we present a comprehensive journey of the customer or story of the customer, and then we discuss like what uh, problems we can solve, what are the risks, what are the unknowns we don't know yet, and again make this more interactive. So yeah, basically these were the steps how we could build the engagement and accountability for making an effective solution uh, that meets the uh, outcome eventually uh, for the designers and the developers. So the steps to sum them up was first to start aligning on the out outcome instead of output, then to not do the MVPs and single discovery, but to embrace the fact that uh, you should do it continuously and that you are able to uh, achieve the outcome in a few iterations, then make the developers and the designers a core contributors of most of the phases of the discovery. And then that the product manager's main responsibility is to drive the discovery process and to provide uh, the necessary context and mental models for navigating the problem space. And uh, last but not least, nicest thing about this is that uh, it's not just the PM stuff, because once developers or designers understand the process and how it is best done, then also they can introduce the changes and push their team and their product manager to doing things better um, and more effectively. So, thank you very much for your attention, and now I would welcome your questions. Thank you, Tomasz. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was really insightful. Uh, if you want to ask Tomasz some question, please go ahead, uh, slido.com, slido uh, with key uh, hashtag uh, design hour, and just shoot questions. Um, meanwhile, I have a question for you, Tomasz. Uh, you were talking about some various phases of, of the discovery process. Um, and I wonder, what about the alignment phase? How are the teams involved in this phase? Yeah, so uh, alignment phase actually is uh, written here in the beginning, but actually it happens in uh, multiple places. So the first alignment, what I mean by that is alignment on the outcome. And that's typically thing that uh, the product manager still does uh, uh, mainly, but again, teams should be aligned on the objective. Then next alignment is uh, in the definition phase because you need to sometimes zoom into a specific area of, of the problem space. And then uh, another phase of the alignment is when you are creating the experiments because uh, especially the leading metrics, the leading key results, you are able to do uh, with a combination of the solution. So there are actually three phases where to do the alignment and during the experiments teams are the main drivers of that. During the definition phase they should be heavily aligned and during the first alignment, fa alignment phase it's like 80-20, uh, 80% 80, 80 product managers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we also have one question in Slido so we can have a look. Um, so you mentioned feedback lag. How can you be sure that it was the changes you made in one iteration at the cause of the feedback you detected uh, later on? Can you comment on that? Yeah, yeah. So the main thing for us is uh, to meet the objective. So uh, and if we meet the objective by chance and there is low probability of that, that it's still a good outcome for us, right? Since the key results, especially the lagging one that tell us that we met the objective uh, actually are connected to the objective, then uh, it's a good thing we meet them. And uh, doing the, uh, yeah, so basically that's that. And the feedback lag, feedback lag it's a, uh, uh, 
just the thing that we need to incorporate and for us to make sure that we are not losing attention from an outcome or a topic after the first iteration, but keep it, for example, for a half a year or three quarters of a year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I hope it answered the question. Uh, so there are no other questions uh, in the Slido. So um, you can still ask more questions um, about this topic and put it into Slido. We can uh, get back uh, to it later at the end of the session. So for now, thank you so much very much.